The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Cause you take good care of me. Good morning, church. We're going to jump back into Psalm 96. Yesterday, we began teaching Psalm 96. And we only got a chance really to teach through the first seven verses. So we're going to finish teaching this psalm. We're going to give a little bit more understanding on Psalm 96 today. Tomorrow, we'll go into Psalm 97. The Lord is just doing so many amazing things here in Brazil. I am just so blessed and honored and excited. And we've been preaching a lot. We preached five days in a row. We preached a three-day conference, a Sunday night, obviously our Monday Book of the Revelation class. And God just showed up every single time. And then we're preaching this Thursday night uh, again at the church. We preached that on Sunday, which is the Assemblies of God or Assembly of J. Deus. Lero Duvayas, Lero Dos Vayas, however you say it. God bless the pastor if he hears that. But uh, we're, we're going to be there again. We're going to be posting information on our social media so that way you can come and join us and experience it. It's an awesome time. God moved powerfully Sunday night. He's going to do the same on Thursday. Uh, the retreat that we're going to be preaching at is this coming Saturday. Uh, I think the retreat's all weekend, but we will be there Saturday uh, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night to be preaching there. So there's a lot of things going on. Just make sure you're following us, Blank Slate Ministries. That way you can get all of the updates and information. I always try to post uh, the, the poster for it so you know the date and time, the location. And I try to make sure I send those out at least a little bit in advance, a couple days in advance so you can plan. But please make sure you're joining us in all the different ways. Uh, that we are here in Brazil. If you're anywhere around us, we're in Ananidewa, Belém, that whole kind of general area in Para, a Para. So, if you're if you're around this area, please make sure you join us and follow us. Uh, please make sure you're sharing this with all your friends. The information that we're putting out is not just for you; it's for everybody. So, the way God's moving in your life, God wants to move in other people's lives, and that's. One of the most amazing things so we encourage you just to continue to follow continue to share continue to receive from the lord and i just want to say thank you for that subscribing liking commenting sharing it's just a it's an amazing thing and i do want to share just one thought real quick when it comes to sharing a lot of times when you're asked to share you know if a pastor asks you to share a church what they mean is i want you to share our ministry which means Tell people about Blank Slate Ministries, and that's that's the, the thing they want you to do, and that's a correct understanding. We do want you to share our ministry. We want other people to know, hey, this is Blank Slate Ministries. You can go to them for teaching. There's over a thousand sermons there. You can go and receive the Word of God. We want that to be the case, number one, for sure. But more than that, for my heart, I want you to share the Word of God. What you receive from this ministry, I want you to share. I was thinking about this last night that somebody, uh, somebody's asked me before, they're like, well, what if somebody comes and they learn from you? They come to your ministry, they receive the teaching, or you preach in a church or whatever it may be, and you share this with them, you share your revelation, and then a week later, they go into their church they preach the exact same message that you preached and they never mention your name or give you credit. How do you feel? Well, I've told people before, I don't care. And what I mean by I don't care, I mean it doesn't bother me that you do that. I actually want you to do that. I want you to take what you receive of the revelation of the word of God from us 
and take it to the world. Whether you give us credit or not, whether you mention us or not, doesn't really matter to me. What matters is that the people receive the word of God. It's not about us being bigger or better or having a big name or having none of that matters to me. What matters to me is people meeting Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about Blank Slate Ministries. It's about Jesus. The reason why I was thinking about this is I was in a church Sunday night and I was we preached this whole thing and I got home and it, it was it was a little bit late. We it'd been a long night. I was sweaty. I it's probably the most I've sweat in a church in a long time. <laughs> the power of God was heavy. But as I was just getting home and you know getting getting settled down, you know, take a shower, relax, all that kind of stuff, I, I realized in that moment I was like. I never introduced myself and I, and I and I realized I probably haven't introduced myself in the past five or six churches I've been into you know I wouldn't say thanks to the pastor I would introduce my translator or my fiance if she was there like but I would never even say my name and I realized that because yesterday after I preached one of the young gentlemen asked the pastor what is his name and I realized I never even said my name. I, I never introduced myself. I just said, open your Bible, 1 Kings 17, and started to declare the truth. I just started preaching. I started testifying of God. Because in my heart, I really don't believe it's about me. I believe it's about Jesus. So if you don't remember me, it doesn't matter. What If you remember the word of God, that's what matters. It's not about, oh man, this one person laid his hands on me and that's how I got it. No, if you say, I don't remember who it was, but God touched me, that's what I care about. I care about you receiving from God. I care about you remembering it was God. It's God who sets people free and heals the sick and raises the dead. It's the power of God that delivers. It's the power of God that moves in your life. So if you never remember my name, that's okay. I actually prefer it that way. I prefer that you only remember Jesus because it's about him. It's not about us. And so I don't even know why I'm talking about this, but it's on my heart. It's, you know, especially in America, it's about getting a bigger ministry and being known and having a name and being great. And it, Everybody's trying to look at being somebody. I don't care about being somebody. I care about Jesus being somebody. I, I care about Jesus being preeminent in all of our lives. I care about Jesus touching our lives. I care about Jesus being the focus of our lives. I care about the Father receiving glory. That's what I care about. So there's probably a, that's why I don't always even I almost never say my name in churches. I do, I don't even introduce myself. Because the person that delivers the message, that's, I'm a vessel. Just like you're a vessel. Just like every, we're, we're just vessels for God to operate through. As I surrender and die to myself, it's Christ that lives in me. And if Christ lives through me, let God be glorified. I'll take a back seat and I'm okay with that. And so, I hope that blesses you. It blesses me. So let's jump in today. Psalm 96. We're going to do verses 8 to 13 today. It's 13 verses, not 12, 13. So we're going to read verses 8 to 13 today. So if you would open your Bible, we're going to pray and then we're going to jump right into it. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom revelation in the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We'll go to Psalm 96. We'll start in verse 1. We'll just go ahead and read through it all, and then we'll focus on the last part today. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord, all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols. 
but the Lord hath the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give unto the Lord, O you kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of his in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heaven rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh. For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. That's a powerful psalm. And we're going to go just take a couple minutes to go back over what we talked about yesterday which is the first part of Psalm 96, where it says, Sing unto the Lord a new psalm. We talked about yesterday. If you read the context of a new psalm throughout the Bible, except for one, all of the instances are eschatological, referring to when Jesus returns. And the way we sing a new song is based on the new things that we see, because there are things that we have not seen yet in the earth that we will see in the generation in which the Lord returns. You say, well, what are those? Read the book of the Revelation. That's where we see it. That's why in Revelation 5, it talks about singing a new song. This new song is because there's new things happening in the earth. Seems very obvious, but for some people, that's still a hard concept. Well, you know, people say, well, I just made, I just recorded a new album. Here's some new songs. Yet you're singing about the cross, which we've sang about for 2,000 years. The song in your mind is new because you just wrote it, but the actual message of the psalm has been known for 2,000 years. There's a message that's yet future in which we will see God do these things in the earth, and that's when that new song will be sung based on what God is going to do in the generation in which the Lord returns through up to through in and after the great tribulation when jesus rules and reigns on the earth now one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about yesterday is that the gods of the nations are idols the things that god refers to as idols in the nations is referring mostly to covetedness covetedness is idolatry but that's always referring to the natural things in the earth that people worship above the creator they worship the creation more than the creator and the things that they worship in that nature is gold and silver and it's it's money and things of that nature it's all rooted back to covetedness but it's the love of the world that's why it's idols it's idolatry in the eyes of god it's the thing that causes people to think that i can do it in and of myself it's one of the greatest dangers and the greatest deceptions in the world today is that I can do this because I have blah, 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 money, position, prosperity. I live in a specific country, you know, whatever it may be, but it's trust in yourself and not trusting God. We've, I've seen this many times and there's accounts all through it. Just open a history book and read through it. Look back at people's lives. There have been people with great wealth that in a moment, it's all gone. Because of their sin, because of their things, God, just, it, it's it's taken from them. You know, they 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 commit adultery and they lose all of their finances. They, you know, they have this big business and it goes bankrupt in a day because of a mistake and whatever. And and, and people have all this trust in what they have and then it's gone in a moment. And they're like, oh no, that's what I trusted in. It's why. All of the gods of the nations are idols. You, I mean, you can see it in the in the in the heathen countries of the world when they where people worship idols and idolatry in a in a strong way. Um, it's not the idol itself. Now there is idols. You know, they make the little Buddha statue or the Hindu gods or whatever it may be. There is that. There is a specific idol picture. You know, whether it's a statue or whatever. But it's not the statue that's causing the idolatry. It's the covetedness behind the statue. 
You say, give us an example. Well, all you have to do is go back to Acts chapter 19, in which the apostle Paul goes into the church of Ephesus. Or he starts the church of Ephesus. He starts the revival in Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 19, uh, the silversmith, uh, I don't remember his name. We're not going to go there. But the silversmith causes a riot in the city because he's saying, hey, this, this Paul is doing this thing. We're going to lose all of our money because these people won't buy the statue to the great goddess Diana. He, he said, we got to stop this man because we're going to lose all of our money. So it wasn't the idol that they really cared about. It's the money that they cared about. And every time I've ever seen problems in people's lives, in all of these areas, it's always money. Money is what causes people to lie and to steal and to cheat and to do all of these evil and ungodly things. The love of the money. Love of money is the root of all evil. It's covetousness. This is what is called idolatry. But the Lord made the heavens. Sometimes we forget that. Will God take care of me? Will God do this? Will God do that? God made it. He made all of it. What makes you think the man that created all of it cannot bring you what you need? Yet you worship the creation more than you do the creator. But we want to give unto the Lord strength and glory. We want to get these things. Well, how do you give the Lord something? This is a very interesting question. We've talked about this before, but especially in Revelation, how do you give the Lord honor and strength and glory and power? And how do you give God something? Does not God have all things already? Does God, how do you give the Lord anything? Well, you give God what God gave you. The same way you give your love to God, I give God love. Because I first received the love of God. You can't even love God without receiving God's love first. So the way we give glory and strength is the glory and strength God gave us and placed in us the way we live our life to give it back to God in sacrifice. I live my life in a way that the power God gave me, I give back to God. And the way I open space when I preach for God to move. I take what God has given me to give back to God. It's just amazing that this is why we, this is part of the reason why praise and worship and all these things happen the way they do. It's because God did his part, and because he did his part, it causes a response for us to do our part. Very powerful. But this is do his name. So there are things that God is deserving of. Give unto the Lord the glory, do unto his name, bring this offering into the courts. So I love the fact that Psalm 96 makes it very clear. There is something that God is deserving of. Me meaning there are things God has done, things God will do, that because of his actions, he deserves this to be done for him. When you are a captive and a prisoner, and the enemy is killing Christians and God stops it, he's due a root. Thank you for what you've done. Here you go. That's the point it's referring to right here. We worship him in the beauty of his holiness, fear before him all the earth, the fear of the Lord. It's not only the beginning of wisdom, but the fear of the Lord, the awe and the reverence of what God is doing and what God has done and what God is currently and will do all references eschatologically generation in which the lord turns when the fire of god starts coming down from heaven it's it's the fear of the lord that will cause us to turn to the lord and bring these things and which the church will say will say to the heathen the lord reigns well where does the lord reign in jerusalem jesus will rule and reign out of jerusalem the world will be established when he comes to rule and reign for a thousand years he will judge the people righteously. And he does not judge according to the outward, but according to the inward part of the heart. We said this yesterday, but I'll say it again. God's judgments are not against God's people. God's judgments are against the ungodly. God is bringing forth the judgments and the recompense in judgment, meaning the actual uh, 
giving of the reward, which is obviously the fire and the ju- all the things in Revelation, the trumpets and the seals, he's giving that against the ungodly because of their actions, because of their heart. Heaven will rejoice. That's amazing. Things in heaven are going to be rejoicing when God does this. This is not a contradiction to God. God is not upset about God judging. You know, the church as a whole is so ignorant of this. We're like, man, he, God must be doing something wrong if he judges. No, 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 no. God is not in a wrong place doing this. All of heaven will be worshiping God when God judges the earth. And the earth will be glad. The sea is going to roar the fullness joy. The trees are going to be rejoicing. Everything on the earth will rejoice to God. Not just people. Everything will give glory to God. Why? Well, in the very beginning when man sinned, man fell. But it says that the whole creation groans and travails until the sons of God be manifested. Not just that, but the earth was brought under the dominion of sin because of man's transgression in the garden. So when man transgressed, obviously man fell, but the entire earth is under this bondage too. So when God comes back, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign, he's not just delivering people, he's actually delivering the world from the sin that has kept it in bondage. He's going to bring that Garden of Eden reality back to the earth where there is no sin, there is no pain, there is no hurt. Where the animal kingdom comes into right order, where a lion and a lamb can lay down together, where a kid can be by a viper's nest and it not hurt him. And like, those are realities. You're like, how could that be? Well, there will be no more sin. When the devil is off the earth, when there's no more sin, righteousness can reign on the earth and the earth will be glad. The earth is waiting for this. The people of God are waiting for this. This is not something we're against. This is something we rejoice that is coming. Because God's removing everything that hinders love. He's removing all the ungodly. He's removing sin and pain and hurt. The severity of the judgments are to remove the things that are coming against God's people and God's kingdom. But he's coming to judge. He's coming to judge in righteousness and in truth. This is something that we said yesterday, but Revelation 19, he who comes on a white horse, which is Jesus in Revelation 19, Revelation 6 is the counterfeit, that's the Antichrist. Revelation 19, the man who comes on a white horse whose name is, uh, uh, whose name is uh, faithful and true. I know that that's exactly what it says, but I'm still going to open it up and read it. Yeah, faithful and true. I know that's what it said. The one on a white horse whose name is faithful and true. Righteousness does he judge and make war. Sometimes we don't see that reality of Jesus. But he is righteous and he is true. And what he's doing is judging and making war. Oh, is God making war with his people? No, God loves his people. What he's making war against is the devil and the Antichrist, the false prophet, and everybody with them that are killing God's people. You know, when Adolf Hitler was in Nazi Germany killing six million Jews, they wanted somebody to come in and stop Hitler. That was a good thing. We agree. That's a good thing. Same thing with Jesus. Sometimes we disconnect and we're like, man, God must be so... No, God wants to remove everything that is ungodly the things that are hurting people god wants to remove so it's not like that again psalm 96 the enthronement psalms of the way we see god when he comes back jesus comes back and then he rules and reigns on the earth so i pray this has blessed you like i said there we could study each of these psalms for months at a time there's so much information in them and we're just taking short overviews one day two days sometimes three But we're going through these psalms pretty quickly. Like I said, we got about, I think, nine more psalms to go. And then we'll jump into the prophets. So I pray this blesses you. Continue to follow us. If you have questions, you can send them in. But drop a comment. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Please make sure you go on to our website and partner with us. But church, I love you. God bless you. 
Pray you have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow. The sparrow's not worried about tomorrow, or the troubles to come. The lily's not thinking about the seasons, the drought or the flood. The tree that's planted by the water isn't phased by the fire. So why should I be? Because you take good care. The sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow.